This video covers several topics related to extinction and origination in the marine realm. Uh, we'll look at long-term trends in extinction and origination rates and the relationship between extinction and origination, um, the concept of a mass extinction, and one important bias that can obscure extinctions in, in local stratigraphic sections. Don't be fooled by the cartoon. The information here is going to be based on marine invertebrates like the rest of the class, so not a lot on dinosaurs. So extinction of species and origination, which is the evolution or the appearance of, of new species, are always occurring. But it's been observed for a few decades at least that the rate of extinction and origination has generally decreased through time. Um, both of these curves you see here, extinction on the left, origination on the right, have quite a lot of volatility in them, and the Cambrian is extremely high, it has extremely high rates of turnover. Uh, but even in the Ordovician through the present, there's a decrease in extinction and an origination, although perhaps less so. So this pattern is, is interesting in itself, but really the significant question is why? Why does extinction rate, why does origination rate de decrease through the Phanerozoic? Well, one possibility is that extinction and origination rates decrease because species actually become better adapted over time. In an evolving lineage of ancestor and descendant species, the descendants could become progressively better adapted to environmental conditions or biotic interactions or other constraints, so might be less likely to go extinct or evolve into another species. However, it's possible to get similar decreases in extinction, extinction and origination with a, a null model, a null model just representing the ex expected outcomes from random fluctuations. So imagine two groups of species, one that has high turnover, such, such as high extinction and high origination, and the other group with low turnover. If both of those groups of species undergo random walks, which you might remember from last class, uh, the species in the high turnover group are more likely to randomly drift their way to extinction, which would leave mostly low turnover groups as time progressives. So marine ecosystems definitely have changed over time from the Cambrian fauna to the Paleozoic fauna to the modern fauna, which we'll talk about uh, next week. Um, so the question then arises, are the decreases in extinction and origination related to that turnover? So you'll uh, examine that question in detail a little more in class. So although extinction and origination have both fluctuated considerably over the Phanerozoic, they show this really intriguing pattern here where times of pronounced extinction are followed right away by intervals with high origination rates. So these are marked with the, the arrows just to show you a couple of such examples. Um, so this suggests that new species may let, be less likely to originate when there's already a lot of existing species, and that it, it may, be, may, may require those existing taxa, which we can call incumbent taxa because they're already present, need to be removed by extinction to open up opportunities for newly originating species to take over. So this relates to the idea, which we'll cover more, more in more detail later on, that species may fulfill some particular ecological role within a community, and that other species aren't likely to evolve in that role unless the ecospace becomes vacant by removing the incumbents through extinction. So extinction rates do fluctuate quite a bit, but there have been various time intervals when many species have gone extinct in a short period of time. Five of these intervals have been recognized as the so-called Big Five mass extinctions. Traditionally, they are the Late Ordovician extinction, number one, uh, the Late Devonian, or something called the franian femenian extinction, which is actually a multi-part event spanning several intervals. You can see around number two there. Uh, the end Permian, the biggest of all time, eliminating more than 90% of marine species in less than a couple hundred thousand years. The end Triassic extinction and the famous uh, end Cretaceous extinction, which doesn't really show up too well here, but was actually a pretty severe crisis. So although the biggest mass extinctions, like the Permian, stand out pretty clearly as an obvious peak in this graph, there's a lot of variation in the non-mass extinction, or the background intervals. And some of the background extinction is actually only a little bit less severe than some of the mass extinctions. So are mass extinctions really a distinct category, or are they just like the biggest events on a continuous spectrum from this background? To get at that, we can compare the magnitude of background and mass extinctions, the effects of the two types, 
and finally the causes of background and mass extinctions. So the, mag the magnitude or the severity of background extinctions should follow a skewed or an asymmetrical distribution. For isolated events that are independent of one another, like you'd expect from extinctions, you should find lots more small ones and the big ones should be rare. That's true not only for extinctions, but also for earthquakes or floods or any sort of independent events. So if mass extinctions are actually a distinct type, they should make a second peak at these large values indicating very severe extinction intensity. If they're not separate, they might just fall along that long right-hand tail of the continuous background extinction. So when we look at the data, there really isn't any evidence for a second peak, no matter how you calculate extinction. So graph C here has a little shoulder at like 0.5 or 0.6, but in all six of the examples here, they have a single peak at fairly low levels of extinction, and then a long tail that gradually extends to larger values. And so the lack of a second peak at, at, at you know, severe extinction values suggests that mass extinctions, in terms of their magnitude at least, are just the tail of a continuous series from background through mass extinction. However, mass extinctions do often differ in their effects on the marine or the terrestrial biota. Uh, for example, uh, Cretaceous mollusks that had planktotrophic larvae were much less likely to go extinct during background times. You can see that the average is 6 million years in the upper left compared to 2 million years for the non-planktotrophs in the lower uh, left. This is true because this, this, or this pattern occurs because they have bigger geographic ranges. And as you found previously when we were thinking about uh, biogeography, the greater dispersal of the planktotrophic larvae increases gene flow and reduces the chance of speciation. But in contrast, if you look at the end Cretaceous extinction, the right-hand column, C and D there, larval type didn't matter at all. About 60% of the planktotrophic larvae went extinct, and also about 60% of the non-planktotrophic taxa went extinct. So what was important during the background is no longer important during the mass extinction. Likewise, geographic range itself is often a pretty important predictor of survival. So this graph shows the results of a logistic regression analysis, which really just tests how extinction, or the risk of going extinct, is affected by the geographic range. And it shows that smaller geographic ranges pretty much always lead to a greater risk of extinction. Any point above zero on the graph means that species that have smaller ranges are more likely to go extinct. However, geographic range is less important um, during a, some extinctions, such as the end Permian or the end Triassic or the end Cretaceous, the values there are closer to zero, which would indicate that there's no relationship between extinction risk and geographic range. So these two case examples highlight a typical difference where traits that are important for survival during the background are often unimportant during mass extinctions, and conversely, mass extinctions may be selective on and acting on traits that were otherwise not important during the background times. So how do the causes of mass extinctions differ from the background? Well, background extinctions are likely caused by a whole variety of factors, biotic and environmental factors. Uh, you know, biotic factors can include like predation or competition or biological disruption of the environment. If you think way back to the effects that bioturbation and burrowing organisms have on the substrate and how that affects the epifaunal organisms that want to live on that substrate, that is one way that you can lead to extinction. These biotic effects are often called the Red Queen. Um, it comes from Alice in Wonderland and refers to how in that book the characters had to run faster and faster just to stay in place with the Red Queen. So in a biological system with competing organisms, species must constantly be evolving to keep up with their evolving predators or their competitors. So they always have to keep running and keep running and running just to stay in place. So environmental factors such as changing climate or oceanography or sea level productivity uh, can also lead to extinction, but because those factors are, are unpredictable, uh, they've been called court jester type effects because you really don't know when they're going to pop up. You know. A, a, bivalve does not know when the climate is going to change. It's going to happen unpredictably. So mass extinctions can also be caused by things like climate change. The late Ordovician extinction is an example of that. 
but they're often triggered by rare events like asteroid impacts, the end Cretaceous being the famous example and the only example of that, um, or these continent-sized volcanic eruptions that caused extreme warming and ocean acidification and other stresses. Uh, the end Permian and the end Triassic extinctions were caused by those flood basalt eruptions, as they're called. So in order to relate mass extinctions to environmental change, you need to know the precise timing and the speed of the extinction. But there's a big problem when you're looking at a local section. So the problem is that the last observed fossil of the species that you find does not actually reflect the true time of extinction. Remember from index fossils and biostratigraphy how the oldest known fossil is never really the true first appearance? Well, this is the same problem, but just in reverse. Because fossilization and sampling are incomplete, there's always gaps in a fossil's range that leads to gaps of unknown duration before and after the observed range as well. So in the example below, the top set of boxes are the true ranges for an abrupt or a sudden extinction and a gradual extinction scenario. But the dots within the boxes are the actual recorded fossils, and so there's note that there's gaps between the dots and also before and after the first and last dots. So the bottom graphs are the actual recorded ranges just from the first dot to the last dot. The gradual extinction still looks gradual in this scenario, but notice how the truly abrupt extinction, the sudden extinction, also looks more gradual. The species appear to go extinct at different times prior to their true extinction. So that smearing of an abrupt extinction to look more gradual is called the Signer-Lips effect, named after the, the two uh, paleontologists who came up with it in the first place. So there's ways of statistically assessing the extinction, and that results in these gray bars in the lower plot. Those bars are called confidence intervals, and they tell you the confidence, how confident you are about the position of the actual extinction. And that indicates that the left-hand one is truly was abrupt. The confidence interval is after the actual disappearances of all the taxa. So here's a real example using end Cretaceous ammonite data from Antarctica. The apparent extinctions, which are the dots and the, and the ranges, look gradual and they all predate the iridium anomaly, which marks the asteroid impact. So does that mean that the ammonites went extinct before the impact and were not related to it at all? Well, we got to remember the signer lips effect, of course. And if you do one of these statistical tests, it suggests that actually all of the ammonites at this site are consistent with a single abrupt extinction at the same time as the impact, because the confidence interval that's generated encompasses the iridium anomaly. So you can see from this that the signal lips effect can be highly deceiving, making abrupt extinctions look much more gradual than they were. So beware when you're making interpretations of this sort of fossil range data.